right, we are jumping back in, guess what, into the Gospel of John. And so if you have a Bible, go ahead, open it up. We are looking at John chapter 13. And as you are turning there, if you've been with us for a while, you should have this verse memorized. This is the reason why this Gospel is written. The Apostle John, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, made it very, very clear. In chapter 20, verse 31, He said, these are written, this book was written so that you, so that I may believe that Jesus is way more than a moral teacher, that he is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, this is where we come into play, and that by believing, this is our responsibility, that you and I may have life in his name. This is why this book was put forward to us, was put forward to the entire world. And we are looking at, looking at John through that lens to see more about Jesus, what he says about himself, so that we can entrust ourselves to his promises and give ourselves to following him. I'm going to add to that this morning that the entire Bible has a purpose, by the way, and it's found actually in Romans chapter 15, verse 4. This is the Apostle Paul, and this is what he's talking about, about Scripture. He says this, for everything that was written in the past, that is, all the Scriptures, was written to teach us. So that through endurance and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. And so this is my prayer in Sunday mornings and every time that we read. That from the scripture, and we base what we do here in the scripture. I tie the messages to the scripture as scripture is authoritative. Scripture is alive. Scripture is permanent. And so as we read the scripture, that we would have encouragement to persevere, right, in the faith. Sometimes life is hard. The world is not a safe place. There are wars. There are shootings. There are people who have abused their power. There are things that happen, car wrecks and the like. It takes faith and encouragement to continue to run the race up before us, to continue to, in the faith, and endure to the end. They're given to us, the Scripture, so that we may have, here's the optimal word, hope, right? That there's more beyond this life. There's other, there's true life beyond death, right? That we would have hope found in the promises of Scripture that's seen in the fulfillment of Christ, who is the yes and the amen. This is why Scripture was written for us. This is why we read it. This is why we say, God, read me through it, that we would be encouraged, that we would have faith and hope, and that we would persevere in this life. Now, the Apostle Paul adds to that um, description this prayer, which I think is great. And this is a good prayer for us to pray. This is Romans 15, verse 5. It says, now, may the God who gives endurance and encouragement, don't you like that, right? One of God's primary roles is to encourage you to continue trusting and living and loving. God loves to do this, and I love this description. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity. Don't you like that, right? You're all lovely, but some of us are hard to love. We can say amen, right? There's disagreements on things at times, right? That's okay, But we're asking God to encourage us and that through the scriptures and through this prayer that God would grant us a spirit of unity among ourselves as you follow Christ Jesus. Verse 6 is so great. So that with one heart 
and one <laughs> mouth, we together may glorify God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. The end goal of Scripture and encouragement and perseverance and unity is the glory of God, right? That would be unified in our heart, in our spirit, and then with one voice, we would praise God. Now, when we sing together, it's just not the warm-up for the sermon, right? That's ridiculous, okay? It is important for us to engage our mind, and we have thoughtful words, to engage our emotions, to engage our memory. Songs, by the way, get into our muscle memory that helps us to remember things even when our mind slips at times. Songs matter, praise matter, and we can all do it at the same time, right? Now, we can maybe repeat words at the same time, but we can surely sing words at the same time. And your voice in this place matters, right? This is where singing songs, not just to God, but when I hear a, a, a sister singing the same words, I'm encouraged. When I'm hearing Rick over my right ear, because that brother sings, let's go, Rick, come on now, don't put your head down, right? I'm encouraged. When I'm quiet sometimes, and sometimes I pray and I hear your voices, it's encouraging that we are praising God. God. So regardless if you sing well or sing poorly, it's not about <laughs> the sound of your voice, but it's the dis dispensation or the disposition of your heart, right? That we're here singing praises to God. And so it is a privilege to join each other together. So now hopefully we're clear on why the Gospel of John was written. Hopefully you understand how important it is to be in Scripture and that the God of encouragement and endurance helps us through them. I hope you are reading this Scripture on your own and we're going to put out new plans and you can get ready for this new year and so many of you are reading them. We're actually going to be launching a class to, to help us called How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. That's going to, you're going to hear more about that. It gives you some tools to really dig into the Scripture. And so it is important. So again, my hope today is that at the end of this message, of course, number one, that you would hear from the Lord. Second, that you would be encouraged today through this Scripture to continue going forward. And that your hope would be renewed as our faith is grown and built and strengthened and our understanding of Christ is seen more clearly, that we indeed would see Jesus. So we're covering a big passage today, and I broke it down to three points, but no poem at the end. A good sermon, three points, and a poem. We'll just have three points, so, you know, maybe it's a B or B minus, but at least three <laughs> points. And I made them really personal. Often I'll say you or us, but I said me in these points because I want you to understand this is for you, okay? It's not about you, but it's for you. And so in this passage, these are the points that Jesus knows me, fully, right? Knows you fully. I want you to understand that and the implications of being fully known. Today in our passage, we'll see that Jesus shows me who he is. And again, we're going to see that in the passage. And thirdly, Jesus grows me to be like him, right? So he knows me fully, he shows me who he is, and he grows me to be like him. So let's put ourselves back in this passage again, going to John chapter 13. Now, if you've been here, you understand we've been tracking with Christ, his ministry, and now it is time. It's the night before, actually the very moment we're going to read this, where Judas goes out to betray him. We are in the upper room. The city is full of people. There's anticipation as to what Jesus would do. There's these hallelujahs, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord as he came in on a donkey. There is this conspiracy of the leaders looking for an opportunity to put Jesus to death, put Lazarus to death and kind of stamp out 
This movement of people who believe in Jesus. And here are then the disciples in the upper room. This is the final Passover that they would celebrate together with Christ. And I can't imagine being in in Christ's shoes is what he was thinking about. He knew the scripture. He knew what was going to happen. He knew the agony that he would be soon enduring. He knew that a close friend that he's been with day after day and month after month was soon going to betray him. He was speaking some of his final words to his disciples, speaking some of these words to us as well who call him Savior. And so we saw Jesus in his great power last week and his great um, position taking the lowest spot and cleaning this manual, menial task, the defeat of his followers said, hey, I've given you an example. Do the same as well as you represent me. Love each other. Jesus did th- just did that in the previous passage. And so now we're going to continue as the disciples are there and we are leaning in to hear the words of Jesus. John faithfully recorded them for us. And the first, again, point is Jesus knows me fully. So this is John chapter 13, starting with verse 18. And I'm reading in the NIV version, lots of good versions out there. The NIV is right in front of you as well. So this is what Jesus said. He says, now, I'm not referring to all of you, okay? All of those who were there, the 12 plus Jesus, Jesus knew that one of them was going to betray him. He says, now, I know those I have chosen. I'm going to come back to that. For this is, but this is to fulfill this passage of Scripture He who shared my bread has turned against me. Okay, we're going to stop right there. One, we can see that Jesus knows you. He knows your purpose and he knows your future. If you think God has forgotten about you or doesn't quite get you, you are wrong. Okay, he knows everything about you, down to the very hairs on your head. He knows your desires. He knows your thoughts. He knows your activities. He knows your purpose. He knows your past. He knows your present. And he knows your future. Jesus is qualified to guide and lead you. Jesus is qualified to take care of you. Jesus is qualified to speak truth to you because he knows you and I in our entirety. No one has to clean themselves up to come to Christ, by the way, right? Jesus uh, didn't say, come follow me after you clean up a few things. He never said that. And he never says that. Present tense, that. He gives us an invitation that says, come follow me. That's it, right? And as we follow him, we see him. And as we see him, we know him. And as we know him, we are fully known. And we want to become more like him. And the Holy Spirit works in us to help us to become more like Christ. All you need to follow Jesus is an invitation, He's given it to you. The creator of the universe has given it to you. Let that sink in. God wants you to be with him. Just as you are. No shame, no hiding, no... Boy, I don't know if he knows me fully. He does. He loves you. He calls you. Come. Be with me. 
Jesus said in this passage, I know those who I have chosen. Now, in this context, he's talking about his disciples, Shirley, and also Judas. Judas was there, right? And Judas also had purpose. Jesus knew Judas' heart before he ever laid eyes physically on Judas. He knew what he was going to do, and he chose him. Now, that's kind of crazy to think about, right? If you knew someone was going to betray them, would you bring them into your intimate friendship? Jesus did. So much so, we'll read in just a little bit, that no one knew who was going to betray them, right? They had no idea. You know why they had no idea? Because Jesus never kind of pointed out, "Mm, it's that guy right there, right? He loved them all the same, right? He understood, and ultimately in Christ, our purpose is to become like Jesus and to glorify him. But others choose not to do so. And God knows that as well. We don't know it, but he does. And even Judas had a purpose to fulfill, and we have a purpose to fulfill as well. God knows your purpose. You are God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he's created in advance for you to do. Ephesians 2, chapter, excuse me, Ephesians 2, verse 10, right? You have a purpose. Do you know that? You do. If you say, well, you know, I'm not as gifted as so-and-so, but you are gifted. You know why I know that? Because Jesus says that. You have gifts, you have a calling, you have purpose. As long as you can breathe, there is stuff for you to do that will glorify God. Even if you are just on your bed in hospice and it's hard enough to breathe, you can pray and glorify God, not just in your living, but also in your dying. And you say amen to that. There's 0% unemployment in the kingdom of God, right? Zero. And so, no, if you feel like, oh, no no one likes me, or I don't have any purpose, you know what? Start loving people in every way that you can, and you will not have time to do much of anything else, right? However you can, wherever you can, whenever you can, love people, right? He knows you, and you have purpose, and he knows the future. He knows exactly what will happen. God's not like up in heaven looking around. I'm like, oh, I hope it turns out okay. I can't believe they just did that, (gasps) right? It's not God, omniscient, all-knowing, all-powerful. He knows, and we see this in Christ. He knows what will happen, how it will happen, and by whom. Jesus allows these things to happen to give evidence as to, number one, who people are. It's crazy, right? Why do good things happen to bad people, or why do bad things happen to good people? opportunity to give evidence as to who you are, what's in your heart, and also it gives opportunity for people to understand who he is. People ultimately will be held accountable, right? And we can see God's grace and his glory in this. So Jesus knowing the future means we can trust his teaching. And you can trust his guidance. And that he tells us the truth. Right? What will happen with 100% certainty at the knowledge of what is to come. Which means you can trust Christ. And we can say amen to that. 
great implications as we look to his promises that are yet to be fulfilled, including, I will come back again. If you are with me, you will be resurrected. Do you trust his word? I have faith because I believe in the faithfulness of Christ. I trust that there's eternity based upon what he said, what is revealed, what is seen in creation, what we know. So Jesus, in this short little sentence, tells us you are known, tells us we have purpose, tells us that you have a future, and I want you to personalize it. He knows you. You can trust Him. Now, second in this passage, and again, this is a primary point of the Gospel of John. Second, Jesus shows me who He is. And in this Gospel and in His life, time after time after time after time, He showed the world and told us who He is, that He is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. And he shows it one more time in this group with his disciples as they were huddled together as he was soon to go to the cross. He told them again who he is. This is John chapter 13, verse 19. It says, I am telling you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that, here it is, I am who I am. Ego and me in the Greek, he is claiming divinity again one more time. Saying, I, I am telling you what's going to happen, right? That I will be betrayed. He's been telling them and he was telling them right here. I'm telling you before it happens so that you will understand who I am. This is what Jesus says. That you will know, even though that there's difficulty, and there is darkness, and there is death, and there is disease, and there is despondency, I am still sovereign, and I am still God. Right? Don't be alarmed. So he says, hey, hey, I'm telling you this before it happens, so when it does happen, you will believe that I am God. Right? Now, I am who I am is a significant phrase, and we have talked about it. But let me give you a couple more passages that Jesus was referencing in his mind. This is Isaiah chapter 41, and these disciples would have known the Old Testament. And I love this. This is Isaiah the prophet speaking um, for God, being empowered by the Holy Spirit. And he was being challenged by people who were serving idols. And this is the challenge, and I love this passage. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 21. The Lord says, hey, hey, to you idols, set forth your case, those who serve these people, says the Lord. Now bring your proofs, says the God of Jacob. Let them bring them, and let these idols tell us what's going to happen, right? Tell us what has already happened, the former things, what they are. Tell us, O oh, great and wise one, that we may consider them that we may know their outcome or declare to us the things to come. Tell us what is to come hereafter, that we may know that you are God. Do something good or do harm, that we may be dismayed and terrified. Can you get the sarcasm here? (laughs) Behold, you are nothing, and your work less than nothing. An abomination is he who chooses you. Woo! Let's go, right? Again, Isaiah picks up this same language, right? I can't help but quote it because it's powerful. Thus says the Lord, Isaiah 45. The King of Israel and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I'm the first, I'm the last. Besides me, there's no God who's like me. Let Him proclaim it. Let them declare and set it before me. Since I appointed an ancient people, what have you done, right? Let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from the old and declared it? You're my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? 
There is no rock, I know not any. One of the characteristics of God is knowing the future. So when Jesus says, hey, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen, okay, it's going to happen. In doing so, they recognize that Jesus is doing only what God can do. Now, are there prophecies, right? Things that God can reveal? Surely He can, but only the Spirit of God can do it if it's true, right? There are false prophets, people who proclaim, <clears throat> even in our day, such and such is going to happen, and then when such and such doesn't happen, don't believe the such and such who said it. Thank you for the amens, brothers. I'm just telling you. Test it, try it, see if this is Jesus. Because only God can predict the future in 100% accuracy every single time. So Jesus was saying, hey, I'm God. He's saying it again one more time to the fellows gathered around. And then he continues in verse 20. He says, very truly, I tell you, whoever accepts Anyone I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. So see this connection, the log logical connection. Now he's preparing to send his disciples out. As he tells us to go and make disciples of all nations, sound familiar, right? Teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and I will be with you to the end of the age. This is Matthew chapter 28. He's saying, now, when I send you, you are going to represent me. And when you speak about me to other people, including you, to your co-workers, including you, to your neighbors, including you, to your family, if they receive these words of yours, they're receiving me. And when they receive me, they're receiving the Father. So he's linking all of us together in Christ, right? This is a, an amazing connection. This is an amazing a revelation again and again and again. He's saying, I and the Father am one, and when my Spirit is in you and I send you out as my representative, people will believe in me. If they believe, they accept you. They will accept me. If they accept me, they'll accept the Father. This is important theology that is restating the connectivity of him to the Father and the connectivity of us to him and the connectivity of the message to other people to bring them into the flock or the fold. So he told them this, reassuring them. Again, on the eve of his crucifixion, Guys, I want you to remember this. So when you go and you proclaim Christ, Christ is with you. Right? It's an invitation through your very lips. Right? How are people going to hear about Christ if someone doesn't tell them? Right? Not just from a pulpit, but from your mouth. Right? Pray for your family if you're gathering in Thanksgiving. Right? Not just to pray that you can endure. <laughs> Pray that if they don't know Christ, they will know Christ. For Christmas, at Christmas time, they're playing our music, right? Joy to the world. The Lord has come. Pray. And then step up in courage. Because if they are rejecting the message of Christ, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting Christ. Right? And we feel that surely. But it's an honor not only to rejoice with Christ, but to be rejected with Christ. So these guys were being prepared this way. Jesus told them this. And then verse 21, after he said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit. And he testified, very truly I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. Now, it's kind of weird to think. Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen. And yet he was troubled in spirit, internally tied up 
in knots, so to speak. He loved Judas even though Judas betrayed him. Now that should blow your mind. What was going to happen to him, as we'll read later on, he eventually took his own life. The scattering to a degree of the disciples, his friends. This trouble, I believe, was not, he was troubled about himself. He knew what was happening. We see this um, amplified in the Garden of Gethsemane, right, where he's praying, Father, take this cup from me. But this anguish is different than that because it's connected to what was going to happen to the betrayer and to those he was betraying. God in his knowing all things has not separated his mind from his heart. He knows that there's catastrophe and he's just not standing aloof saying, "Mm, I knew that was going to happen. Troubles his heart. I want you to know the mind of God, but I want you to know the heart of God. He's not indifferent to suffering. He actually knows it quite well and has empathy and compassion. He's not indifferent to darkness. And we'll see in this passage in just a moment, it says, and it was night, dark, hard to see, hard to know, hard to breathe, hard to move. Even in the betrayal, Jesus was troubled. No, also the emotion of Christ, and he shows us his emotion as well. He says, I'm telling you, one of you is going to betray me. Now, we go back to the room. This is verse 22. His disciples, disciples stared at one another. At a loss to know which of them he meant. Now, can you imagine being there? They're like, what? And they're just looking around at each other. Can you imagine being there? Kind of squinty-eyed, like, hmm. Which one of you is it? And perhaps they're going in the Rolodex of their mind, if you know what a Rolodex is, the files of your mind. Thinking, wait a second. What about him? Wait a second. Oh, maybe it's him. Oh, maybe it's her. Maybe it's him. Maybe Can you imagine what's going on in their mind? Who is it? Who would dare do such a thing? And again, nobody knew who it was. Because Jesus treated them all the same. Now, here's Peter again. Our man, Peter. Now, one of them, verse 23, one of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, and I like this. By the way, this is a description of John. John, John's identity was found in his relationship to Jesus. Some of you need to hear that. Your identity isn't in what you do because someday that will be taken away from you. There's a lot of things that people put their identity in, but for our Christians, our identity comes from a relationship with Jesus. I am loved by Christ, and that is enough. That's powerful. So John describes himself this way. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. They were gathered around the table. Verse 24, Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, ask him which one he means. You see what's going on here? Oh, that was loud. (laughs) The guy who jumps out of boats when he sees Jesus. The guy who brought a sword with him, remember that, and cut off an ear? This is that guy. So they were looking around squinty-eyed at each other. John was sitting next to Jesus. 
Peter's like, hey, John, come over here. Hey, come over here. <clears throat> hey, ask him which one he needs. That's what's going on here with Peter. Let me know. I'll take care of this right now. So John, getting close to Jesus, right? A whispered conversation, so to speak. Leaned back against Jesus and asked him, Hey, Lord, who is it? <laughs> and Jesus answered John. This is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in a dish. Okay, Mediterranean style, all of the main courses were there, and you just kind of grab. That's how it worked back then. So he grabs the bread, dips it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, which means to me Judas was right next, right next to him. He didn't put Judas at the end of the table. Do you understand what's going on here? Heartbroken, I'm sure. I'm getting emotional just thinking about it. I give this to my friend. And he gave it to Judas. Son of Simon Iscariot. There was two Judases, so to make it clear. Now as soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. Jesus knew that he would be demonically oppressed, possessed, not by just any run-of-the-mill demon. <laughs> there is such a thing, but by Satan himself. By the way, I've heard it said that uh, demons can't be in the presence of Jesus. That's wrong. Enter this passage and many others. If you read the book of Job, they can be in the presence of Jesus. By the way, this demonic connection harkens all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. If you remember reading Genesis, right, where the curse was given to the serpent, God said to that snake, right? you're going to, you, you're going to strike his heel, and this was pointing to Christ, but he will crush your head. So this was a demonically inspired, this is by not just an earthly friend, check this out, but someone who was in the presence of God forever, who betrayed him then, betrays him now. This is the real power behind the scenes. If you don't believe me, read Ephesians chapter 6. Do not fight against flesh and blood. So verse 27, the second, excuse me, verse, yeah, 27, the second part of this. <laughs> so, so Jesus told him, what you're about to do, do it quickly. And my, my thought is, I think it's right, do this quickly before Peter finds out. <laughs> Seriously. What you're going to do, you better get on it right now. Right? Verse 28. So Jesus said this, what you're about to do, do it quickly. Everyone heard him. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Well, why did he say that to Judas? Well, Judas' responsibility was to be in charge of the money. Some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. As soon as Jesus had taken the bread, he went out. And check this line out. And it was not one of the darkest nights that ever came to this earth. It was night, as dark as it could 
happy. This betrayal of a close friend who had permeated the heart of one who was open to it. And you can look back at Judas and all of the things and you see the highlights and like, mm, okay. Penetrated this. The leaders wanted to destroy, wanted to take out the presence of Christ. By the way, that is how the demonic even works today. Destroy friendship, destroy companionship, destroy life, and bring people apart because united we are strong, but separated you are vulnerable. That's why the church is important. Being known, not just by God, but by others, is important. The devil does not sleep, y'all. Active even to this day, we can see this manifestations even here in Rockford, even here in Holmes, and throughout various places as we read about it, as we say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. May God open our eyes to see what's the behind the evil that is the real evil, and it was night. And then in that setting of pitch darkness, spiritually, relationally, even physically, the next verse is now you're going to see the glory. Verse 31, when he was gone, Jesus said, the son, now the Son of Man is glorified. And God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. So the glory of the cross is seen in the selfless and sinless sacrifice of God for those he loves. What is the ultimate purpose of the cross? To display God's glory. Your salvation is secondary to the glory of God. In the cross, he shows his great love, his great grace against his great righteousness and his great justice. It is displayed on your behalf so that you can know him and give him glory. Your salvation is secondary to the glory of God. Remember that. Christianity isn't about you. It's for you, but it's about Christ and God and our invitation to participate with Him and receive life eternal in His name as He makes all things new. We behold, display the glory of of Christ, and when it is darkest, the light shines the brightest. Now, it's a time to be glorified that you will understand, and the horror which is the cross displays the great love of God, the great grace of Christ, taking on Him what was due us selfless, sinless act of the heart of God for you. Right? Verse 33. Jesus is telling his disciples now, 11, and uses this term of endearment. My children. You can imagine him saying this with tears in his eyes. <laughs> my friends, my children. I'll be with you only a little longer. You're going to look for me. Just as I told the Jews, I'm telling you now, where I'm going, you cannot come. And this affectionate turn with them, he uses it all, he uses it with you as well. He calls us 
his servant. He calls us brothers and sisters. He calls us friends. He calls us his children. You're his child as well. And if you have children, you understand when you see your child and you speak to them, my child. One day when you are taking your last breath, more than likely your children will be there and you say it in a different way. My precious kids. Jesus is using that tone saying, I'm going to be with you a little little longer and I know you want to be with me and I want to be with you but you cannot come with me on this journey I have to face death on the cross by myself I have to be buried in a tomb by myself and I will be raised by myself and I will make a path for you to come but it's not going to be right now he stands up I know you're going to look for me and I want to be with you but you can't come with me. Not yet. And all that Jesus said and what he did, he showed us who he was. Who the Father is. Will you believe in him? Will you embrace him? Will you honor him? Will you trust him? The one who knows you, who is with you, and will ever be with you. Believe in his promises, be encouraged, have hope. And along the way, he grows us to be like him. This is the last point. He grows me to be like him. Now, Jesus, after saying all these things, now he brings this to the forefront. He says, now, children, a new command I give you. Here it is. Ready? You can memorize this. (laughs) Love one another. And then he connects it to this. As I have loved you. There's a sermon in that all by itself. There is, believe me, many. (laughs) So, check this out. So you, underline this, must love one another. Love for other believers is not optional. (laughs) We'll talk about that. Verse 35. By this, which is the love for one another... Everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Right? So question, right? How is this a new command? Because we know in the Old Testament, Jesus said it himself, the greatest command is to what? Love the Lord your God, right? Though your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And what's another word? Love. Your neighbor as yourself. So, in saying a new command, he's saying an old command. So, how is this command new? This is how it's new. Love each other as I have loved you. Use your power, use your position, use your possessions to sacrificially love other people. Hello, church. As you see me and heard me and experienced this, now love other people like this. If you want to know how to treat people, look at this passage. Love others as I have loved you. (laughs) This is not optional for Christians. What? Yeah. I, you, we must love one another. Specifically in this context, now understand this. 
Those who are other believers who are with us, it does not mean that you don't love the world, and you should, but in this context saying, in particular, you have to, you must love each other, right? The body of Christ. By the way, you can't do that command if you're not in community with other believers, this is how I know, this is how you know that you're a Christian, right? As they were looking around wondering, right? I know that Christ is really in you when you love other people. Right? That's how I know, right? Only the people who are there knows, right? Now, are we to shine our light to the world? Indeed. But in this context, it's saying, in this community of believers, I'm going to make it real personal, in this community of Crosspoint, it's important for us to be together. It's important for us to be together to love each other. And when we love each other, we can prove to each other that we're really a disciple of Christ. But I can hear some of you in your mind say, well, I don't need to prove to anybody that I'm a Christian. Because I love God, and I don't love y'all. Easier for me to stay home and watch football which it is, or go for a walk, or play golf, or be with your precious pets, right? Right, it's easier. I've heard people say this, well, I love Jesus, but I don't love the church. Now, granted, is there church hurt? Yeah, absolutely. Are Christians stupid sometimes? No. <laughs> Do they do hurtful things? Of course. Right? God help us, forgive us, to make it right. Got it? It's grace. Right? But, if you, but if you say you love Jesus, Jesus said, if you love me, you obey his commands. And one of his commands is you must love one another. So if you're not loving other people, you really don't love Jesus. You see the logic there? Okay. Now John the Apostle, who wrote this book, also wrote a couple other books. First, second, and third John, letters to the church, and of course the book of Revelation, same guy. Right? He picks up this same theme, and let me lay down a couple of the verses of how important this command is for us. This is John chapter, uh, 1 John chapter 4, 7, these will be up here. Beloved, that's us, if you're a Christian, let us love one another. For love is from who? God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God, Right? It's evidence, proof that you indeed love Christ. Another verse, we know that we have passed out of death into life. We know, the body of believers know, you know, that we have passed out of death into life. How do we know this? Because we love who? The brothers or the sisters, right? The family, this is how we know. Right? If you come to church and you don't love anybody... Are you a Christian? By this it is evident who are the children of God. By what? And who are the children of the devil? Okay? Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. Nor is the one who does not love his brother. So if you say you love God and you don't love other Christians, no scripture says you're a liar. The truth's not in you. Don't deceive yourself. <laughs> and some people aren't easy to love. It's not none of you in here, you're all lovely. Don't know about the guy with the microphone, but y'all all right. We have to say, God, give me your love for other people. But guess what? You don't have it in yourself. You need God to love you so that you can rightly love other people. That's how we show. It's important. <laughs> Whoever says he's in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light. And this was John, the one who Jesus loved, reminding the church, hey, bros, hey, sisters, it's important. Community is important. Love is important. This is how we know. <laughs> this is important for us to understand. Loving you is the way that God showed who he was. Loving people is the way 
you show others who you are. Do you understand that? We don't always do it perfect, right? but that's our desire. Verse 36. Okay. Come into the landing pretty quick. Simon Peter asked him, right? Hey, you guys can't follow me. Remember that's what he says? Love one another. It's important. Just love each other as I've loved you. You must do this. You have to love each other. Love each other. So Simon Peter asked him, hey, Lord, where are you going? Right? I'm your bodyguard. Remember? Where are you going? Jesus replied, Peter, where I'm going, you cannot follow me. I'll tell you that again. You remember what I just said? But Peter, you will follow later. Now, this is a promise. Now, catch this. It's a prophecy. You will follow later. Verse 37, and we're going to see this coming forward. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? <laughs> Just like a good junior high boy. And then he makes this claim. I'll lay down my life for you. Jesus looks at him. Will you really lay down your life for me, Peter? Truly I tell you, before the rooster crows this morning, you will disown me three times. Don't you like it that God tells us the truth? He doesn't just pat us in the head and say, well, if you're a good boy, it's okay. Sometimes we do things that aren't in line with the will of God. And so here's Peter bragging in his own strength. Oh, I'll never do that. You will. Jesus tells us the truth about ourselves so that we can grow to be like him. You understand that? When he points things out to us, he isn't trying to say, mm, you're terrible. He's saying, there's some stuff we've got to work on here. In your own strength, you can't do this, and sometimes you will deny me, and we'll see it. But we'll also see, I like this hope that was impregnated in the discipline. You will follow me later. But right now, Peter, you're going to be sifted. Sifted. So that the impurities will be taken out. That you'll be ready to then turn back and strengthen your brothers. And this is exactly what happens as Peter preaches the first sermon on the day of Pentecost with boldness in the power of the Spirit, not in his own power. Right? It's beautiful. We're going to see it again in, in weeks coming forward. Jesus, because of his great love for us, helps us to see the truth about ourselves. And we can say amen. He gives us opportunities for us to see ourselves as we are so that with this information we can be shaped into his image by turning and trusting in him in humility so that he can be the strength and the song of our hearts. Okay. okay, so this is what I want you to remember and I don't know what the Lord's speaking to you. Right? He's speaking something. Think about it. Perhaps you need to know that, that, that Jesus knows you. Okay, He knows you. Think about what that means. Jesus shows us himself, and he grows us to be like him. I want you to reflect upon what you've heard today, asking you to make an appropriate response. <laughs> we know the phrase, whatever happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Well, whatever happens inside the church does not stay inside the church. In this building, I mean. You are the church. Think about it. God, what's going on in me? Am I trying to, to love you in my own strength or defend you in my own strength? God, help me. Maybe it's like, huh, I don't really love even my spouse. No, you may not, but guess what? Jesus does help me with that. Or whomever it is, I don't know. 
Maybe you're scared about dying. Maybe you're scared of what's going on in the world. Guess what? Take heart. Jesus knows it's going to be okay in the end. Okay. Keep loving him. Keep persevering with him. Keep knowing him. Keep glorifying him regardless of your circumstances. His promises are good. He is with you to the end of the age. You can trust him. Jesus is the Son of God, the Christ. By believing in him, you'll have eternal life. If you haven't given your heart to Christ, step up. What are you waiting for? And if you have love, you'll never be in eternity wishing, oh, I wish I wouldn't have loved that person so much. Not going to happen. So talk to God about this. So I'm going to pray for us. We're going to sing. If you have prayer stuff, we have this sign over here. It says prayer, right? Say, well, I don't want to bother those people. I got to like walk against the crowd and whatever. I'm just going to go home. Stop it. That's why we're here. Get some prayer. See this right up here? There's never a closed sign. If you want to pray, pray. Sit here. Ask someone to pray for you. That's how we love each other. Well, I don't want to burden them with your problems. Part of the being in the body of Christ is bearing one another's burdens. That's why we're here. All right, come on. Stop being so proud. Be honest. And love each other with your honesty and your humility and in God's strength. So let's do that. All right, so I'm going to pray for us. We're going to conclude. If you want prayer, do it. Take these things to heart. So God, here we are. And my friends are here. Your children are here. You're here. Holy Spirit, I do ask that you give us ears to hear. Help us really think about this. And will you highlight stuff, even right now? And you know what we need because you know us perfectly. You know what we need because you know what we're going to face even when we go home today. God, I ask that we would be a congregation who loves you so dearly that we take your word very seriously and we love each other completely as Christ you did. And God, we need your help to do that, Lord. And in all these things, may you be glorified. You are good and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.